I'm a TV engineer by degree. I went to school after World War II uh, on the GI Bill of Rights like a lot of other guys. And uh, in 1951, I built, built a TV set. And even then, I had the idea of doing something other than just watching a set, set with, uh, yeah, with a you know, normal black and white TV set. But nothing came of it until much later. By this time, I'm running a big division. I have a, I have a yeah, direct labor payroll of maybe 10 million bucks. I can kind of afford to put a couple of guys in a room and tell them to build something. So when I, I tell, told them to build something, I move spots around the screen. Uh, within a couple of weeks, we were shooting at the screen with light guns, we were moving spots around with uh, joysticks, and then uh, one of the two guys I, I put into that room came up with a thought uh, of a third component, third spot, which turned out to be the ball in the ball game, and the next thing we were playing ping pong, handball, volleyball. Of course, but then the question was, now that we have it, what the hell do we do with it? Huh? I took some scrib scribbled notes I had and converted them to a four-page paper, which became the, uh, the sort of a Magna Carta of the video game uh, industry. Uh, on that basis, you know, we applied for patents and eventually patents issued, which are the, you know, the original video game patents. We built a succession of seven different models, of which the brown box was the last. All of those, except for a couple that the lawyers lost over the years, uh, are at the Smithsonian. Now, we call the brown box the brown box because it was basically a couple of aluminum chassis back to back. They looked ugly as sin, so we covered them with a, a self-adhesive, uh, you know, a wood grain type of brown paper, uh, Presto brown box. Uh, well, the brown box is the central unit. Cables come out, just like they did in other video games, to hand controls that allow, uh, in a ball game, for example, the ball to be, the paddles to be moved up and down, sideways, and the ball to be launched. And there are a bunch of switches up front. And we had a set of cards you could place between the switches. We had a card for handball, for volleyball, for ping pong, and you flip the switches accordingly, and bingo, and it set up the games. The first chassis, we have a big brute thing like this. Uh, we demonstrated the management because it started as a skunk works, but we had to go public sooner or later within the company. Uh, it had a, uh, a light gun attached to it. It had joysticks. Yeah. I had an audio tape player uh, play a, uh, a recording of instructions for each game, voice recordings through the machine that came out the loudspeaker of the television set. So the first time in history we had video games that were announced by voiceover along with joysticks. So when you look at today's uh, video game consoles, there's still a lot of our DNA in them, right? So once the brown box was finished, the, the question of what to do with it, uh, to whom to license it, was still up in the air. It took us a whole year before we managed to get RCA, Sylvania, Philco, everybody who made television sets in this country uh, to come to Nashville, New Hampshire, see a dem uh, take part in a demonstration and make a decision on whether they want to take a license. And they all came, they all said, this is great, this is wonderful, but nobody did anything except, except, except RCA. They, but the, the contract that we negotiated over the next week or two got so onerous for us, we said the hell with it, we walked away from it. Fortunately for us, one of the guys at uh, RCA left, became a VP at Magnavox in their New York office, and told the guys in Fort Wayne at the headquarters uh, to take another look at the brown box. We went there, we being the uh, corporate patent council and myself and Bill Harrison, whom you had on stage way back in Boston several years ago. Uh, we went to Fort Wayne, Indiana, demonstrated, and Jerry Martin, who was the manager of television sets and radio, said it's a go, just like that. One guy with a vision. We used to have uh, milk delivered in a horse and wagon yeah, back in 1924-25. And uh, 30 years later, I'm helping to put a guy on the moon. I built a handle for one of the television cameras that had the transmitter and power supply in it. We built consoles that sat in, at Cape Canaveral and other places monitoring the Saturn vehicle.
Well, I think it's fantastic, you know. Great, great music. Always appreciate it, you know. Jump up and down and stomp and clap their hands and have a real good time watching three big screens and listening to music that they're familiar with and they really get with it.